Hey guys, welcome back to the show. For those of you who are just joining in, we are doing grade 12 chemistry. Now guys, I'm loving the interaction on Facebook. I can see a lot of questions coming in. Make sure you guys have exams coming up. So post your questions, which is on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash mindset TV. And I know I drill this in your head, but it's just to remind you that help is available. For now, let's go through to Phil. But Phil, I was wondering, can mm -hmm. we rather answer some of the questions before you move on? Absolutely, it's slide? all about you guys. Okay, so the first question is from Happy Mureki. Happy, I hope you're listening. He asks, how do you differentiate between an ester and a carboxylic acid? Very nice. Okay, so let's take a look at that question. So esters versus carboxylic acids, really, really tough because they kind of look the same. And like, they, they're really, really close to each other. In fact, you can very often make them into functional isomers. So I'm going to show you an exact example. Okay, so now remember that esters, and just to give you a little bit of background, esters are the really nice uh, smelling chemicals that very often are added to perfumes and foods. Um, that really nice uh, fruity smell that you get off like chewing gums and a lot of sweets, that's from esters. Okay, so now the thing that makes an ester an ester is that there is a carboxyl group and a carboxyl is always the same. Now you might be saying, okay, well, why are you drawing a carboxyl if we're talking about an ester? Well, both of them have got a carboxyl and that's what makes esters and carboxylic acids so tricky. So I've got a carboxyl and a carboxyl, what makes them different? Okay, now an ester is uh, something which links to another carbon. So let's just take a look at how that might look. Now an ester shows that there's an oxygen bridge between two carbons. That's the key. An ester has got carbon, oxygen, carbon. Now carboxylic acids have got something different. Carboxylic acids have got a link to an H over there. They end with a hydrogen. They've got an OH right at the end there. So that's the difference between an ester and a carboxylic acid. Most carboxylic acids, unfortunately, don't smell very good. And in fact, this one, um, I'm pretty sure most of you have eaten actually before. This carboxylic acid is called ethanoic acid, and ethanoic acid is commonly known as vinegar. So that nice sort of like fish and chip smell, I know, I'm a fan. Oh, carboxylic wow. acids taste sometimes pretty good, but they don't smell sweet. They've got that like sour smell to them. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a question about two double bonds, wasn't yes, there? Yes, this was from, goodness, guys, go easy on the names on Facebook. <sighs> called KB La Rose. Uh, wow, okay. <laughs> I hope I said it correctly. Okay. Uh, what do we call alkalines with more than one double bond? Okay, so let's take a look at something which has got more than one double bond. Okay, so now there is, uh, there, there's one particular one that I'd like to focus on, and this is going to be a bit of a mouthful, again. Sorry guys, organic chemistry is full of these really beautiful long names. Okay, so what happens if I've got two double bonds inside something? Now, this doesn't usually happen in high school chemistry, uh, but I'm going to show you how to name this quickly. So let's do this. I hope you are strapped in. Let's just make sure that it's all filled up with hydrogen. Remember, each carbon needs four bonds. Count them if you don't trust me. Now, this particular chemical is actually used in making tires. Okay, it's used to make the rubber which is around tires, which is super, super tough. Okay, now first I've got to name this chemical. Okay, one, two, three, four carbons. Let's name them in blue because that's where the backbone is. One, two, three, four carbons gets me the prefix but. Okay, now you've got to be very careful. I see something happening on carbon number one and again on carbon number three. <sighs> okay, now breathe in deep because if you've got more than one double bonds, you've got to say in and in again. Now, if you're saying in after this consonant, what they actually want you to do is to actually say buta, and that's how to separate. This is called a diene. So on the first and the third carbon, I will find my two enes. Whew, okay, buta, 1,3 diene. Okay, now let's just unpack that name because I think that's a lot to take in, and it's more than most exams will ask you. I said on the first and the third, I will find a double bond. The reason I have to say die is because I'm looking for two of the same thing. They are in position number one and position number three. It's just like a postal address. Those eens need to know where to live. Right, but was just a reference that I've got four carbons. Buta is just a naming convention from IUPAC. They've done that to separate out the consonants. Phew, quite tough, eh? Very okay. much so. So if you guys are bringing up these sort of questions, it means that you're practicing, and that is beautiful because that's the only way to get better at this stuff. But there were some more questions, weren't there? 
There the, were. I think you're going to be working on one next. Uh, that's good news. Chemical equilibriums. This was posted by Hippie. Hippie, I see you're very active, uh, especially when it comes to physical science. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, guys, we love to see you active on the page, asking each other questions, asking us questions. Well, this one's for you. There's a chemical equilibrium question right here, talking about carbon dioxide and carbon in a closed system. So uh, let's just do a little bit of a quick chat here because this one's going to take a little bit of chewing. It says that carbon dioxide reacts with carbon in a closed system. Okay, remember the differences between the types of systems. You get isolated, closed, and open to produce carbon monoxide, some pretty bad stuff. Uh, according to the following balanced chemical equation. Okay, it's really important that you've got this balanced chemical equation because it's what I'm going to refer to. Now guys, I want you to write this down and I want you to pay special attention because I've noticed a lot of metrics get really, really stuck because they forget about the phases, the phase indicators. Carbon dioxide is a gas. Remember, I'm breathing it out all the time. Carbon is a solid, just like the stuff that you might be putting in a bry to warm yourself up and to cook some food this weekend. And uh, carbon monoxide, sadly, is a very toxic gas. Um, very, very nasty stuff that comes out of cars, exhausts. Okay, now what does the double arrow indicate in the equation above? And that is not actually as obvious to many people as I thought it was. So I've got like one arrow going left, and I've got one arrow going right, and that's like kind of weird. This is the worst like directions I've ever got. It's that way. Okay, now most people look at this and they're just kind of like it's a weird equal sign. Guys, it's not. It means that I've got a forward reaction and I've got a reverse reaction and they're proceeding at the same rate. That is how you get dynamic chemical equilibrium. You've got to have a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. Uh, we will unpack this very slowly. So that double arrow means that this reaction is reversible. It means that there is a forward and a reverse reaction. Okay, now there are many chemical reactions which are not normally reversible. So, I mean, for instance, if you decide uh, you're tired of studying and you're just going to light all of your chemical notes on fire by applying some heat, please don't. Just to, like, <laughs> please don't burn your house down or burn your chemical notes. But I know most of you at one point have thought about like, mm, if I apply a little bit of like lighter to the side of my chem textbook, and I know, and I know everyone's felt like this at some point. It's like, you know, it's one in the morning, your exams are next. You just want to light everything on fire. Please don't. Please don't. Okay, so now the problem is that that's not a reversible chemical reaction. If it burns, you can't like chuck the ashes back in a fridge and like try and cram the gases back in there and hope it'll turn back into a chemical textbook. It's not going to happen, guys. That's non-reversible reaction. It's what's known as kinetically impaired. Now, that's not like some, you know, weird thing that will qualify me for any sort of special needs. But kinetically impaired means that it just can't get over the energy hump. There's too much energy to knit back together that chemical textbook. Uh, so please don't do it because it's not reversible. But this one is. Luckily, we can actually do this, and cars exhausts do this all the time. Catalytic converters try and convert everything into carbon dioxide because it's less toxic. Okay, so now, is the above reaction an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? And you're just going, uh, I don't remember. Well, there's a couple of clues. Now, one way is to look at a graph and you'll notice this graph, I mean, remember this graph, and you'd kind of see, oh, it lands up lower, or it lands up higher, but we don't have a graph like this. What we have is some very confusing mixture of Greek and some symbols and some maths, and all the teachers are saying, oh, but it's easy. No, it's not. I'm telling you, there's English symbols there, there's math symbols, there's like an H and a naught, and it's all weird. So what I want you to do is just like chill out a little bit and see what this means. Okay, so delta H means that we are taking a look at the difference in energy before and after the reaction. It tells me that this is greater than zero. So that means that going in the forward reaction, and the delta H usually talks about the forward reaction. Okay, so the forward reaction is the one that delta H talks about. This means that the energy or the potential energy of the reaction increases over time. So that means that the graph that I drew there initially was wrong. So it means that the energy goes up and lands up over there. So it's gone up a little bit. That means the delta H is larger than zero. That means that it's gone up. And that means that this is an endothermic reaction. The chemicals have more energy than they did before. So that means that this is an endothermic reaction. OK, but now most people are going, uh, I've learned the graph. I understand. But most people don't kind of get a, a like, I, I love having a feel for the words before I move on. Endothermic, again, is not something that I, I don't know. Atik, when's the last time you talked about something like endothermic? 
Never. <laughs> exactly. This is the problem. The scientists don't speak to normal people, and I used to be one. I'm getting better every day. But endothermic is just such a weird word. Uh, endothermic meaning like inside heat. Um, totally weird. But we need to understand what endothermic really means. Endothermic is a reaction which absorbs energy from the surroundings. Okay, now I know some people that kind of like walk into the room and they just suck out all the air and, you know, it's not nice. <laughs> but uh, endothermic means that energy has to go into the reaction. So this means that generally their surrounding will become cold. Now I want you to think about like reactions. If you've ever coached yourself on a sports field or something like that, uh, very often what's happened is they've put like a first aid pack on you and like they crushed up something and it went instantly cold, like these cold packs. And what's happened is, is an endothermic reaction has absorbed heat from the environment, including you, to cool down your muscles and stop you from being inflamed. So endothermic reactions generally make the reaction colder. Now, exothermic reactions like burning a textbook, as I described earlier, those release heat and give out heat. Now, this is a really interesting, weird thing, is that most reactions are exothermic. Now, I want, you know, maybe that's a good question for the viewers at home. I want you guys to discuss maybe on Facebook why most reactions that we observe in nature are exothermic and not endothermic. Now, there's very few reactions that are actually endothermic, but there's one really super important one that happens in plants. I wonder if they can get that. A little bit of a trick. Okay, so now it tells me that this is all happening, and uh, now it's starting to throw some numbers at me. Now, things are getting really serious. It says, initially, an unknown amount. Now, you can be sure if they say an unknown amount, they want you to know by the end of the question what that amount is. So I've got carbon dioxide is exposed to a hot carbon at 800 degrees Celsius, that's pretty toasty, in a sealed two decimeter cubed container. Whew. Okay, breathe, there's a lot of numbers floating around. And then it says the equilibrium constant or Kc, so that's the constant of concentration for the reaction at this temperature is 14. Okay, just stop right there. Okay, now this KC thing. I've noticed that a bunch of textbooks and a bunch of memos don't actually concentrate on what KC actually is. KC is a ratio. Um, in university textbooks, they do say, yeah, eventually it does get a unit, and that's chemically correct. But for all, in, for all intents and purposes in high school, it doesn't have a, uh, a unit because it's a ratio of two concentration. Concentration divided by concentration. In this one, it doesn't have a unit. Okay, but if a Kc ratio is 14, what does it mean? Let's just take a look at what Kc actually is. Now, most of you at home are screaming at the screen and you're saying, oh, Phil, really? Now, I've marked, and, I, and I'm not going to lie here, over 10,000 uh, metric papers, and you'd be surprised how many people get this wrong. I'm actually glad you mentioned it because there's a few, quest, uh, few students who need assistance good. in how to calculate Kc. Ah, good. Okay, guys. KC is, is just one of these things. It's going to come up in every single exam. Now, if I was going into my final exam and I knew there was a particular type of question, I would want to know about it because I could be like, oh, I'm scared of it, but maybe I need to defeat this monster. KC is one of those, and it doesn't have to be a monster if we take it nice step by step. Okay, so KC surprised me in my matric finals. I was just like, oh, but I managed to get through it because I was taught to take things step by step, and I'm going to show you those steps now. Okay, so now what's happening is that Kc is this ratio which is equal to uh, my products, the concentration of my products, uh, divided by my reactants. Okay, now guys, you're not going to take it so slowly in the exams because I'm taking time out to explain each step. Please don't panic if it takes you long initially. You guys have got the whole weekend to practice this and make yourself absolutely slick. Now, if my products of reactants are equal to 14, what does it mean if I get a number of 14 out? Guys, well, let's turn 14 back into a fraction. That means that 14 is above 1. I mean, that's the simplest way I can rewrite this as a fraction. It's 14 over 1. That means that the products are so much larger than the reactants. There are 14 times as much products than reactants. And then this is also a question which has come up. A lot of people think that that means that we don't have equilibrium. Now. I can understand why you think that. Because most people go, oh, reactants equals products equals equilibrium. No, 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 no. Whoa, stop the car right there. Products does not necessarily equal react. It might. Forward reaction rate equals reverse reaction rate. And that's the definition of equilibrium. 
Now, when this one reached that point where the forward reaction was making as much as the reverse reaction, there's 14 times as much product as reactant. And that answers the first part of our question. We're going to get around to the calculation, but let's just finish this off before our next ad break. So it says, how will the equilibrium concentration of the product compare to that of the reactants? Now, I've got to choose larger than, smaller than, or equal to. In the exams, please follow the instructions. It means that the product is going to be larger than. Don't write anything else. Don't get fancy. They gave you your three options. So that's the one I write down. Guys, please get your pens, papers, calculators, because we are going to tackle the, the KC beast when we come back. Fantastic. Mm. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick ad break, and then we're going to continue after this. Mm -hmm.